So tell me what happened. He's a butthead. I'm going to stop you there. We don't use names. And his head's not a butt, like, quantifiably. Well, what would you call your clone husband after he goes to see the new Resident Evil movie without you? It's a reboot. <laughs> reboot? <laughs> yeah, reboot. <laughs> well, reboot <laughs> or not, the Resident Evil movies are the foundation of our relationship. It's like you've got this secret part of yourself now that I'm not, uh, I'm no longer privy to. I've got a little exercise I want both of you guys to try. Jordan's going to stay in here and recap the entire reboot, <laughs> and we can decide if Jordan should be furious at Jordan forever. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, fine. Well, the movie's apparently made by a guy named Davis Raccoon. Don't start by lying to me. What, were the producers Larry Resident and Jeff Evil? Shh, shh, shh. He's saying something to you. Listen. Anyway, we see a boy and a girl purpling on top of a bunk bed amidst a sea of bunk beds, which just screams orphanage. And you know, the girl kind of looks like a young Mila Jovovich, ironically, or at least I think she does, because this movie is dark as shit, like literally, and the whole time. And this isn't some day for night filter action either, because there are some truly grainy shots, like the ones you get trying to film a dick flick under the covers. I assume. The movie looks like pixelated penis blobs is my point. But yeah, so the little girl is woken up by some nasty hands and decides to follow the hands to see who's attached to them. Naturally, they're attached to some freaky ass zombie girl wearing a face on her face. They don't really get a chance to chat though because a doctor named William Birkin walks in and is like, what you doing here? And her brother who she had been purpling with and who apparently followed her mansplains that his sister sleepwalks a lot. And the doctor's like, good enough for me. I didn't actually give a shit. And he real quick reveals that the kids are Chris and Claire Redfield from the games. Does that excite you? Titillate you? Make your thumbstick quiver in anticipation? Oh, and, and yeah, they were in the Raccoon City Orphanage run by Umbrella Corp. And boom, now we're in the future past, past future of 1998. Claire's developed into a grown ass woman burdened with troubles, including the pressure to be more interesting than a bed sheet wearing Mila Jovovich beating zombies to death with a bike lock. Even tougher, she's riding in a truck piloted by an obnoxious trucker dude and his Doberman that will 100% be killed by the end of this movie. Unfortunately, the trucker dude drives like a Raiders wide receiver and runs over a woman in the middle of the road. He and Claire get out of the truck and are like, dang, that sucks. But then they're distracted by something and the woman runs off into the woods and the dog licks the blood on the ground because sometimes dogs are gross. We then get an initial taste of the cinematographer's favorite technique of all time, which is constant, endless, slow digital zooms that are in and out. Who cares if the shot gets pixelated as how cool is it that you can set keyframes in Adobe Premiere? The trucker is less impressed though and demands Claire hop back in the truck so they can leave before somebody digitally zooms him to jail. Elsewhere, a cop named, oh my God, Leon, whoa, is passed out in a bar. But he's not drunk. He just, he gets sleepy. Also, he's a rookie cop who once shot another cop in his butthole, causing Leon to be transferred to the sleepy town of Raccoon City, which everybody on the internet assures me is a very normal name for a town because other towns have stupid names too. Like, look, here's Mayonnaise Tank, Kansas. So now Raccoon City doesn't sound so weird anymore, huh? Anyway, the bar is also populated with three other people who don't appear to be cops, but as we learn later, are. You're a freak, Valentine. And also there are two Normal looking cops who walk in and are very mean to sweet sensitive Leon. Also, there's a bartender whose eyeballs leak blood, but she doesn't seem to think it's an issue. But I bet that it is. Claire, for her part, finally makes it into town and immediately breaks into somebody's house because knocking wasn't working and there's a kid with male pattern baldness next door. And even worse, the kid's mom has male pattern baldness. She gets inside and it turns out her brother, who looks shockingly like the hacker dude from the original Resident Evil movie, lives there. The two silly siblings sort of half-heartedly yell some exposition at each other about how they haven't heard from each other in five years and how Claire knows a guy named Ben who claims the water here is bad because Umbrella. And do you still think you can date Jill Valentine, the girl we saw in the last scene in the bar who was very pretty and also from the video game, sort of? At least Game of Thrones had the courtesy to do these types of scenes with everybody naked. But okay, so Chris has to go to his job and his workmates, which include the aforementioned Jill, Albert, oh my God, could it be Wesker, the least funny member of the Letterkenny trio playing a lesser Resident Evil character. My butt cheeks are clenched up real tight right here, so whatever you're driving at, get after it. Another lesser Resident Evil character, Leon, and a shockingly aggravated lesser Resident Evil character, police chief named Brian Donut Irons. Chris is presumably a member of STARS, which 
Sort of seems like this town's version of a SWAT team, but the town is so small it appears over half the force is on the SWAT team? Because we only see four non-stars cops, including the chief, versus five stars cops. And also they have a freaking helicopter? Or are they all stars cops, but some just dress differently? Why not just call them cops? And why once they lose contact with a couple of the maybe cops, do they send a helicopter to investigate? Do they not have star cars? Surely a helicopter's overkill unless they're also hoping to depose a despot in the process. Or do they need it because they want to fly like stars? And while we're at it, why is the police chief so adamant that we know this movie is set in the 90s? He literally describes what is in his mind an ideal date, as sarcasm, mind you, where he mentions Blockbuster, Steve Perry still being in Journey, and other 90s crap that I'd forgotten because my pen dried up 11 minutes into the movie. But it was a lot of things from the 90s. Oh, and 90s twist, Wesker has a Palm Pilot. Double 90s twist, he has no idea what it is or how to use it. Triple 90s twist, he's secretly working for somebody besides the Star Cops, and they're the ones who gave him the Palm Pilot loaded with some information, as well as a warning that the whole city will be destroyed by Umbrella at 6 a.m. Why not just destroy it at sunrise? Why be so specific? So at sunrise this morning, Raccoon City will be completely sanitized. Back at Chris's house, Claire is attacked by the bald people. Then she leaves. Chris and company land their Black Hawk in the woods outside the mansion of the dude that found an Umbrella Corp. They find evidence the two other star cops, probs got messed up, so they investigate the big old house. Once inside, they remember they're in a horror movie, so they split up. Jill goes with Wesker, much to Chris's horny dismay, and Richard Aiken partners up with Chris, which sucks because Chris doesn't want to kiss him at all. Wesker and Jill end up in a part of the house that has a piano, and Wesker apparently fancies himself something of a virtuoso because he just goes to town plunking on the thing. This opens up a secret passageway to secrets untold, and he admits to Jill that he's working for somebody to help take down Umbrella, and he's trying to steal some Umbrella virus samples. Jill gets really offended by the notion that Wesker was planning to leave this small sh objectively poisoned town, actively being overrun by zombies, and potentially not seeing his friends as often. He's good friends. What a butt. <sighs> it's not coming, Dave. I don't know what it is. Oh, Lord. Before they can finish hashing out their drama, it turns out Letterkenny got bit, and that made him want to fly his helicopter into the mansion. Bitch, he does, blowing things up. Much better explosions this time around, so that's nice. Wesker and Jill are fine, though, so Wesker goes into the Tunnel of Secrets, and Jill does not. And apparently this mansion is freaking huge because while the one side is exploding, the other side with Chris and the, the other guy is being overrun by zombies. And I must admit, the gunfire sound sign is friggin' rad. <laughs> Real video games should use these samples. During this, there's a moment where Chris fights a bunch of zombies in pitch blackness, occasionally punctuated by gunfire. It both looks amazing and almost certainly will give somebody a seizure, but it's followed by a three minute sequence of Chris sitting on the ground, holding a flickering lighter and staring at a zombie that slowly scoots closer and closer. It eventually sort of attacks him, but man, it takes a long time. It's just scooting and scooting. A little zombie scooter. I'll just say for a supposed horror movie, this does a really shitty job with the whole scares thing. It always telegraphs what's gonna happen. And in general, the scary parts almost always happen off screen or way in the background. Presumably this is also the editor can show us how slickly he can zoom <laughs> to wherever the action is without even moving the camera. It's all digital, technology's amazing. Anyway, the tertiary or realistic quaternary character gets eaten and the pretty boy main character is saved by the pretty girl secondary character. The two go down Wesker's secret tunnel of secrets, his chamber of secrets, if you will. What secrets will they uncover in this secrets chamber? Back at the station, Leanna's falling asleep. Again, because he either suffers from narcolepsy or he's been watching this movie. While he naps, the truck driver's dog turns into a zombie, bites the trucker, turns him into a zombie, causing his driving skills to again dip to that of a Raiders wide receiver, resulting in him flipping his truck so hard that it explodes and catches on fire. Sort of like the entire Raiders organization. But the undead trucker manages to escape the blaze and walk into the police station before being immediately gunned down by the police chief? I know that the trucker was a zombie, but how the hell did the cop know? Leon sort of asks why he did that, why he shot a dude apparently looking for help, and the chief says, I bet there'll be more of them. What, what does he mean? 
More people that need help but deserve a bullet to the neck? I can't tell if the chief is supposed to be super shrewd or this movie is a surprisingly aggressive condemnation of an armed police force. <laughs> Either way, I hate it! The chief then does what apparently no other cop has done after murdering a man in cold blood and quits his job. He just up and leaves and says Leon is in charge now. Unfortunately, the chief quickly learns that Umbrella is pretty serious about the whole destroying the city and everybody in it at six thing, so they're not letting anybody leave via road. So the chief drives back to the station where he's attacked by the zombie dog, which, yeah, all right, yeah, Claire beats it to death with a fire extinguisher. War, war never changes, nor does beating dogs to death in a Resident Evil movie. <laughs> Anyway, the three new best friends decide their only chance to escape the impending doom is via a secret passageway in the old orphanage that leads to the mansion where the rest of the characters are secret hunting. But before they do that, Claire and Leon go grab some guns from the gun basement, and while down there, Leon finds conspiracy Ben from Claire's internet chat board. He says, hi, steals Leon's gun, then gets eaten by a zombie. Then Leon and Claire shoot Ben and the zombie, but Leon is just a, he's just a klutz during the entire interaction. He's just falling over desk and just being a wacky goof. For fans, Leon's an action hero, but we really wanted to go back to the original second game, where he's quite a nerdy, reluctant hero. <laughs> Guys. It's so silly. So now the three musketeers are in the orphanage and they're attacked by a liquor thing from the games that's inexplicably worse looking and less terrifying and objectively smaller than the one from the movie two decades ago. Fortunately, it's murdered by the face on face girl because she's nice and she and Claire are friends, says Wikipedia. I didn't catch the part where they painted each other's nails and talked about the cutest zombie boys while sitting in their top bunks, but Okay. Meanwhile, in the chamber, the Chamber of Secrets, Wesker stumbles upon the good doctor from the beginning of the movie, and it turns out he's still around, and he's also married and has a kid. Whether it's his biological kid, or an orphan he took in, or an orphan he grew from the liver of an AIDS victim or something is unclear, but anyway, he's trying to smuggle what he alternately claims is both his life's work and also God's work out of the lab and into the hills of wherever they are. Presumably, he believes he's cured death, but he's scooping up drug samples next to an obviously obliterated corpse barely held together with sutures, so God apparently works in disgusting ways. But anyway, Wesker is like, okay, give me whatever tubes you got. And the doctor's like, uh, ever heard of the T-virus or G-virus or the G-spot or the taint? This is my life's work and, uh, and also God's work. I have to find the mythical clitoris. And then he shoots Wesker with a secret gun, but then Wesker shoots him with a not so secret gun. Then the doctor's wife picks up the no longer secret gun, so Wesker shoots her, and then the daughter, seemingly not great at reading the room, also picks up the gun, and Wesker gets shot from behind by Jill, but it seemed like maybe Wesker had shot the girl, because we hear the gunshot and don't immediately see where it came from. What a classic movie gunshot fake out. That never gets old. Never, never. It's always fun, every time. <laughs> Wesker claims he never would have actually shot the girl, but of course he'd say that now. He seems like he's gonna die, but you know. Resident Evil. The doctor, meanwhile, injects himself with a bit of the G virus lying on the floor and mutates into a big ass mountain of meat covered in eyeballs. Not really sure how many people would choose to become that instead of quietly succumbing to cancer or whatever, but hey, if the good Lord called me one day to become an undead mound of rotting flesh meat and eyeballs, who am I to refuse the call? Then Chris and the doctor kind of half acidly limply fight for a while in the laziest of final boss fights before Claire mercifully steps in and puts us and the doc's hearts chambers of secrets out of their misery. Obviously the doctor's not actually dead yet because Resident Evil, but he's down for now. I don't really understand how getting shot a bunch of times always knocks these super zombies unconscious for a while. Maybe lead makes them sleepy? Also, maybe somebody should consider double tapping them. I mean, where's Jesse Eisenberg when you need him? Time to nut up or shut up. Anyway, then Chris, Claire, Jill, Leon, and the little girl who nobody has shot yet hop aboard a secret fan favorite Alexi 5000 train, and though they get pretty far out of the tunnel, Raccoon City ultimately explodes around them before they can fully escape. Don't worry, the heroes are safe. However, a cow, the movie assures us, 
is not. Also, hilariously, this movie does one of those classic cuts before Jill can fully get out a naughty swear word because of the explosion. But every character has been carpet bombing hard F-bombs the entire movie. That makes sense in a Marvel movie trying to rein in Sam Jack so they can, you know, stay PG-13. Oh no. Well done. But what's the logic in this context? Is it a joke? If so, you should have had Leon say it or something as he fell asleep for the 18th time. Speaking of, the doctor monster apparently woke up, so he attacks again. But Leon fires a literal rocket launcher in an enclosed train car underneath a recently collapsed mountain, and everybody's completely fine. The rocket launchers in this universe are very targeted and controlled, apparently. The heroes leave the tunnel and everybody presumes them dead, but, you know, they're not. What adventures might they take on next? Also, how exactly will Umbrella explain an entire city collapsing and exploding? Natural gas? Whatever. And since this is 2021, there's also a mid credit stinger that reveals Wesker survived too. But whatever drug they injected him with to keep him alive had the negative side effect of making light too bright for his eyes. So they give him sunglasses. Because God forbid they don't give a satisfactory origin story for his dumb shades. We're seeing who he really is underneath the sunglasses. Also, Maybe the doctor should have taken that drug. Seems better to be light sensitive than a Lovecraftian horror blob. Are those the two options? I take the light one. Oh, and also a woman named Ada Wong on the games comes in and says something about how, yeah, there'll be more stuff if the movie, you know, does well, I Man. guess. Uh, well, I hope not. See, you didn't miss a thing. Your relationship is still rock solid. I guess you're right, Doc. I'm sorry, Jordan. It's okay, Jordan. I'm sorry I went without you. Sounds like you've been punished enough. You wanna go see another movie? Maybe a palate cleanser? I'm here for this. What you guys are doing here today, this is real. Have you ever seen the Santa Claus? I haven't. Sounds terrible. Oh, they are. This is why I come to work every day.